Hi, I'm Karalia from the Yoga Lunchbox, and today I have the great pleasure of interviewing Catherine Munro, who is the author of Spilt Milk Yoga, there's the book. Um, over the last 10 years, her work has centered largely around working with groups and helping them to better understand and facilitate the learning process, and that's work that she's brought into this book. So welcome, Catherine. Thank you. Thanks for interviewing me. I'm interested to see what we're going to talk about. I know. I'm so stoked to a, talk about parenting. And actually, let's get that. So the book is motherhood. But I do want to make it clear that everything in this book applies to fatherhood. And you're talking primarily about your own experience as a mother. So, of course, you reference motherhood. Um, and we will talk a lot about motherhood in this interview. But I don't want fathers to feel like this conversation is not about them or what they do. Um, so that's the preface. Did you want to add to that at all? <laughs> yeah, I think it's a really good point because it's often brought up. So dads will say, oh, but it, you know, is it for dads too? Or, um, and I'm hearing back from people, from dads, that they're just supplanting the word father with the word mother and getting a lot out of the book. Yeah. And some people are writing, you know, supplanting it with CEO. I know... Um, uh, my mum actually said oh, she she was practicing of thinking of us, you know, her children, and then she went through the grandchildren. And then she actually the work I need to do here is with um, my husband. So she puts she puts partner in there. So so I think it's relevant because it's um, it's learning, and we're all in yeah. process, and we're all learning, and we're all in relationship with ourselves and others. So I think that is that is really you're right. It is a, it is. For everyone, but I think I really wanted to honour the work that mothers do, mm. and I think that we have a particular relationship to our role as mothers, and we have we have our biology, and we also have social pressures in contemporary motherhood that are unique and really particular to being a mother at this time around things like work. Mm. Um, and career, and then there's our whole biologic and a whole human element of being a mother that exists right outside of the capitalist or you know sort of market paradigm, and those two things can sit really uncomfortably alongside each other. And I really, uh, in my life, the majority majority of the people that I hang out with at play centre and you know, people we we were parenting those early years yeah. were. 90% mums. Yeah. Well, you know, I really am speaking to that, that yeah. thing. Because that's yeah. a, the nature of the reality of the society we live in is that the primary giver is 90%, maybe, I don't know the exact statistics, but it is a woman <laughs> in general and it is a mother. So when you became a mother way back, what, 10, 15 years ago? 16 years ago, okay. Um, did, were you aware that you were carrying expectations of what it meant to be a mother? Yes, I think I was. I, mean, I was raised a feminist, and um, I think two pieces of advice my mum used to give me was don't get married and don't have children. There's <laughs> <laughs> three girls in my family, so you can imagine that stirred up some great conversations, and we were, um, you know, we, we were all very clear that we would you know, have our own career path and um, that we could do anything. It was that sort of girls could, can do anything framework, and it really... I suppose it was a bit of a, um, a crash for me running into just the overriding biology of the fact that I had a uterus and breasts and hormones that meant that I was the primary caregiver and there were forces at work in me that I hadn't, I was, I hadn't really been prepared to navigate until I met them. Mm -hmm. When, when my baby was born, it just eclipsed everything else. I'd walk into my studio and go, ah, uh, I mean, I just made a person. <laughs> it's the greatest piece of art ever. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But you bring up a really interesting point because lots of us grew up in the 60s or 70s and we did grow up with a sense of feminism. Like, I rejected motherhood completely because I had the sense that to be a mother was less than and it was weak and it was all of this. And I was like, there's no way I want to be a mother. And even when I became a mother, I was very clear that it was not who I was, that it was a role that I was taking on in order to bring out this little being who'd been entrusted to me. And it's interesting that it's almost like feminism turned us against 
motherhood, whereas motherhood should be embraced by feminism as one of the greatest things in the world. We are bringing up the next generation. Yeah, and I think there's a really fantastic quote. Do you know the work of Marilyn Waring? So she yes. was a yes. famous New Zealand MP who, um, and I think I'm quoting her, but she may well be quoting somebody else, saying, motherhood is the unfinished business of feminism. Mm. It's true, and I'm feeling the relevance of that right now, and I felt the relevance of that, which is one of the, the key drivers for me in writing the book. Wow, I love that. Motherhood is the unfinished work of feminism. I want to adopt that as my motto. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's talk a little bit about the book because I get the feeling you and I could just talk all about feminism and motherhood for ages. Um, now, you, the book itself is divided into 52 chapters and they're all quite short, which of course is because as mothers, we're not likely to have a lot of time to read because mm. you're doing a million other things, right? Um, tell me about those chapters and how they're structured. Okay, well, you're absolutely right. I didn't have time to read. I remember picking up Buddhism for Mothers and just opening it and the font was tiny and it seemed really long and I just <laughs> never made it. Yeah, I just didn't, I couldn't get back. I just, it was sort of reassuring just having it by my bedside to know that there was such a thing. Someone was thinking about it, but yeah, I wanted to make it really mother-friendly. So those really short chapters, there's really only two pages of reading, you know, an account of my spilt milk experience as a mum. Mm then a, a page of a practice, a yoga practice applied to that spilt milk, mm -hmm. and then a third page, which is a page of guided self-inquiring, where I'm asking questions um, that guide a process for mums just to come to know their own experience more, to know their own selves mm -hmm. and lives. And um, so I wrote these chapters, and so I, I had them, and a number more, um, sort of in a pile, mm -hmm. and I wasn't sure how to organise them and um, you know I'd organise them this way and then I'd see if, I'd try and see if there was a flow through and I'd try, it was one of the biggest questions when I came to discuss with my publisher how we would structure the book and uh, she suggested and I think it was really good, she said well yeah what about the organising principles mm. in and I thought well the five niyama, uh, all the do's of yoga, that's a really great place to start. Mm. Some really basic things that as mothers we absolutely get. Mm -hmm. we, we understand to pass, you know, we really understand being in the heat <laughs> of the moment and the heat of our emotions and the heat of the pressure of our old family dynamics mm. and then respond to a toddler tantrum. So our responses, I think, are very fresh. I thought, yeah, mothers really know about. Yeah. And, and then as yogis we do too, right? If you're a yogi and you become a mother, then all of a sudden you understand the niyamas. It's like, oh, how can I apply these to motherhood? Yeah. And I think contentment is another one. Mm. Just actually knowing how, you know, when you're doing all those mundane things of being a mum, it's like I'm just, you know, chopping up fruit or I'm wiping up another spill or I'm, you know, reading, hearing the period for the sixth hundredth time and I'm really <laughs> that I don't like this book. Um, I'm so sick of it. Or or I feel like I want to be somewhere else doing something else right now and I'm right, I'm here doing yeah. this thing. I, so, I do wonder how mothers handle motherhood when they don't have a yoga practice. Because I found it really, really challenging and I have a date I have a practice. I'm like, thank God. Yeah. Um, <laughs> did you find that? Like were you practicing when you began motherhood? Well, I think my yoga practice was not um, physical primarily. I did some kind of antenatal yoga with mm -hmm. my first child. I think my mat just sort of sat there getting dusty through the early years. But for me, it was very much an internal process. So contemplation, yeah. you know, all the, a lot of the book is sort of me trying to get to um, sit and meditate and then thinking, actually, as a mother, I don't have a 40 hour slot, I mean, 40 minute slot here. Mm. I'm to, you know, how do I bring this into the moment where I'm hanging out yet another wash of little... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Perfect yeah. opportunity for meditation, right? Yeah. yeah. 
And I love yes. that about it, is the fact that you break um, the box that people have put yoga in because it's firmly about all the other aspects of yoga, about the self-inquiry and the self-study and the understanding and the relationship we have with ourselves and with everybody around us. And, you know, the, there's no asana in it because it's not about asana at all. Mm. It doesn't need to be. Um, and this is one of the things I do love about the book the most is that what's it like when you're going out and speaking to, to people outside of the yoga world? Do they think it's going to have postures in there? Like, do they always come back to postures? Or? Yeah, as soon as they see the word yoga. Yeah. And it's, it's a really interesting conversation I had with a couple of publishers you know, through the um, journey of bringing the book into fruition, into its kind of cop, you know, hard version, um, was the assumption. So, yeah, and when I was at the baby show in Auckland and I spoke to thousands mm. of people, and, um, and fathers and grandmas and grandmas to be and they just assumed when they saw yoga that it would be asana so I would have I came up very quickly with the understanding I needed to say this is yeah. yoga on the inside yeah um, yes yeah. and, that, and that's actually yoga I mean the asana is only there to provoke that inside experience right it's just a tool in the same way that motherhood then becomes a tool so in a way <laughs> postures is equivalent to motherhood yeah. <laughs> Only postures are probably a hell of a lot easier. <laughs> well, yeah, I think um, my favourite, the thing I used to do when I sort of figured it out was legs up the wall. Yeah. That it's the most fantastic restorative pose and your kids can do it too or you can read a book with your legs up the wall or, um, yeah, it was brilliant for me. When I, when I remembered it in the flurry yeah. of having yeah, and I think that's a big part of it is knowing how to integrate all aspects of yoga into your daily life by remembering. I'm um, washing dishes, I can do that while silently chanting, or I can meditate. Or my daughter's going into a tantrum, I can pray. And I love how you describe this you know, that she's getting angry. Do I need to get angry? Or can no. I just stay steady, still and steady, and hold her in that space of anger? Um, I mean, that's so powerful. Yeah, incredibly um, so. So I think that was very much for me. That's. That was my practice. Mm. Yeah, until the space opened up for me to get my act together and go and you know kick off my uh, asana practice again. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, yeah. what's the response been from mothers who are reading the book? Because you talk about spilt milk yoga. You talk about some really you know challenging situations that you've experienced as a mother. What mm. do they say about it? Probably the big thing I'm hearing from mothers is. Thank you for writing that down because I thought that was just me. Yeah. You, um, um, it feels like you're inside my head is another thing, like you're writing my story of these moments. Um, I think appreciation for the brevity of the chapters. Yeah. And the other thing people have said is um, they really felt the book gave them permission at the start to dip in and out, that it wasn't some sort of, um, oh no, yet another book that I'm supposed to get through, that it was mm. a tool for them to grab when they needed it and just take the bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's an appreciation, I suppose, around the structure and how user-friendly it is, how mother-friendly it is. Yeah. So you talk a lot about the difference between surviving motherhood and thriving in motherhood, and in a way it's at the heart of the book. Can you talk about the difference between those two things? Yeah, I think you know, I would have days where I would sink into the couch or, or probably not even let myself do that. You know, I felt like I was getting to the next thing and the next thing, and um, I would sort of fall into bed exhausted. And then you know, with just this idea that I'm desperate to get some sleep so that I can restore myself enough just to get through tomorrow. Mm. So a little bit bracing myself against the demands of the day. So um, what was your question again? So the difference between surviving, which is what you're describing beautifully right now, yes. and then and then surviving, because that's it. When we're surviving, we're so in it that nothing else exists, right? Yeah, and I think I would hear mothers too laugh off that, sort of have Chardonnay moments where they would say something that stressful that had happened, but they were at the point of kind of laughing it off. And I thought, actually, I, today, you know, if I went to, a, to the edge of my patience and had a moment where I lost it at my kids and then I felt crap about myself and then I sort of beat myself up through the day and I got to the end of the day and I was sort of carrying that, I was thinking... Well, actually, this is, it's a, a mirror 
that moment is such a mirror for me to learn something about myself, how I ended up in this space, and actually, I don't want to just get there and feel stink. I want to get there and and use that as, um, and I, I was thinking this is a very much, it's like a kind of judo move, you know, the energy is coming towards you, and you use that energy and um, use it in a beneficial way. Yes. So I thought if I could do that, I would get to the end of the day more purposeful, more aligned, or well, I'd start the day more purposeful and more aligned, get to the end of the day and I'd have had a sort of a line to hold on to, a lifeline of today I'm practicing compassion, say. And even though I would lose my way in the day, I would get to the end of the day going, um, because of that, I'm, I'm closer to being, I'm more the person I want to be, yeah. not the person I want to be. And I want to, um, I think I started to think maybe, um, when I was looking, desperately looking for um, affirmation, I suppose, or, or even just a way to grasp the challenges of motherhood, and I was turning to yoga texts and spiritual texts and not mm. finding anything yeah. there. Motherhood. No, there's not really a, a whole lot that's helpful, is there? <laughs> no, well, actually, most of the yogis that I was reading in the Swamis, they were men. Yeah. Or they were celibate nuns or yeah. householders, and they certainly weren't mothers. And, um, and I thought, well, if I can use these processes, the yoga processes, and apply them to motherhood, and then I began to see that actually motherhood is a part in itself. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, this this is my path. Not just can I get motherhood out of the way so I can get to my path, but going this is my path. So it was a process of wanting to embrace the whole of what was coming at me in the day as learning. And the more challenged I felt, it felt richer because I thought this is there's more learning. And it, you know, sometimes a bit of a blizzard of learning. I just yeah. Cannot, yeah just <laughs> Kind of like playing a video game, right? Once you realize, oh, it's just a game, and the more gold coins I collect, the better. And if each gold coin is that moment, I was calm then. That's a gold coin. <laughs> I haven't played too many video games, but I'll go um, with your analogy. Yeah, I played a lot when I was younger, and I, it, it's, I find it useful. Like you say, when you're going through challenging circumstances all the time, to turn it into, well, if this is a game, and I'm the one that is improve, not improving, because we get told enough we need to improve. It's more like... I am the one that's dropping deeper into who I truly am, you know, as a result of those experiences. Yeah, can I get a gold coin in this moment? And if my gold coin is that I managed to hang out that wash, you know, hang out even just, even tinier than that, I managed to hang out that one little sock and, um, and marvel at something or mm. feel my like being or appreciate that the task that I'm doing has value as a mother. Yeah. Or when somebody comes to me with a request or a hurt or a, and I'm busy doing everything that I don't just appreciate, take this as another demand in that moment, I can feel myself enough, feel my being enough to go, put, put the knife down, put the onion down, put the whatever down, stop and really be present. Mm. With yeah. And so not, when that cuddle comes, I'm going, it's filling my tank up. I'm not just giving out. I'm kind of receiving the blessings of being a mother and appreciating it in the moment. Mm. Very much about slowing that down, appreciating what is, and as you say, it's so invisible, so undervalued, and it's not paid motherhood, so it has no social status. And so how do we connect in with the very human value of learning to love and be loved which I think is really yeah. just human it's the, hi it's the highest calling like, re we, like really it is the highest calling because if you can mother well the child that eventuates you know is grounded and feels worthy and feels centered and then the society that eventuates is all of those things as well. Yeah. So it's interesting you talk about, you know, if we valued motherhood, well, who is the we? And I, I get that 
external society doesn't really value motherhood and we take that on. However, it does feel like if we want to stand in our power as women, it is up to us to claim the value of motherhood in and of itself. And that's why, I think that's why... You wrote this. (laughs) Mothers, because I mean, actually, it could be for dads and CEOs and many other people, but I really want to honour the work of mothers. I think mothers are really at the heart of our social health, And I think if we um, really take care of mothers, we're taking care of the whole planet. You know, we're taking care of the people, we're taking care of our environment, because mothers really care. And they care in a way that we don't really care for other things. I think we care for our kids in a way that is so... um, biologically deep in, in us and so innate that we will we will go to incredible lengths for our children and I think it's it's actually an opportunity that is being completely it's so ignored that it's being missed. It's a missed opportunity at the moment. It could be mothers could be at the heart of education. They could be at the heart of health uh, because they care so much and they're so invested. Mm. And also it even comes back a bit further if we really for mothers so you know it has to be a bit chicken and egg yeah yeah i guess as mothers begin to value themselves and their work more and then that's reflected in society and society externally begins to do that as well Mm. um again i feel like this is a rabbit hole we could disappear (laughs) off down into the Um, policy yeah yeah no but that and but it is i mean the personal is the political and the political is the personal and so how we mother is how we society you know, and how society is, is how we mother, and it all is all sort of one and the same. Yeah, like I said, there's a big rabbit hole there, so we'll, <laughs> we'll stop on that one. Um, one thing you make really clear in this book is that you say it is not a parenting book, because it is not about how to manage your children, how to get them to behave the way you want them to behave, how to get them to do what you want them to do, etc. <laughs> it's more, it, is it completely about how to manage yourself? Yeah. I love that. I love how you stated a couple of times at the beginning. It's not a parenting book. That's right. Because there's so much really good advice out there from parenting experts. And some of it that I gleaned or was told or passed on or given or read was great. But it didn't really, you know, it was sort of problem solving for my kid. Um, or if I saw my daughter as a problem in that moment. Mm. If I came back to me, sometimes... Um, the really difficult part was what was going on inside me while my daughter had a tantrum. Mm. I mean, tantrum schmantrum, it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, and I found a way to work with that that was actually incredibly peacemaking in a lot of ways in myself. I came to really appreciate anger in a new way, but putting my child in time out and following the instructions was one thing, but how I put her in time out. Yeah. What that yeah. experience was for me, or to have my father say over dinner when he was visiting, and I'd gone through the big battle and you know had a big journey with a tantruming toddler, and finally I put her in her room, and I was already feeling a pressure inside myself around his his um, judgment of how I was parenting, and he, when I put her in her room, he said to me, oh, "Well, I wonder what's going on for her right now," and I was thinking. Yeah, I think of just about nothing else, and I'm so stirred up that when I'm putting her in my in her room, I'm all afire with my anger, my hurt, my shame, my guilt, my um, self doubt. Like all of those things affect. Um, can I can I get to a place where I'm putting her in time out lovingly? Yeah, compassionate yeah. for myself, compassionately for her. And I'm steady and clear about the boundaries. And when I mess up with the boundary, do I just feel crap about that for the rest of the day? And I feel, and then my next boundaries are fuzzier and more conflicted. And mm. yeah, because yeah, so then we add that layer of guilt, don't we? Because we're never going to be perfect. We're always going to get it wrong at some point or other. But then if you feel guilty about getting it wrong, <laughs> as well, so let's add another layer of suffering to the suffering. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I thought if I could just attend to my own 
it was going to be so much clearer with my children. And you said a beautiful thing just before, it's so accurate about, um, I think you alluded to the thing of seeing our children as a reflection mm. of ourselves. So wanting our children to behave in a particular way. And there's a, what I find now very amusing, but at the time it was just excruciating, was my daughter's seventh birthday party, where you know I put a lot of effort into getting it you know, really the great birthday party experience. And my mother-in-law was there and my sister-in-law was there. And my daughter just threw the most spectacular tantrum. It was just, you know, it was really a new height of tantrum. And she she screamed as she ran away from her party. This is the worst birthday party. <laughs> and, um, we laugh about it now because, because of course, she's had more worse birthday parties. She hasn't. But um, she's had good birthday parties. But we just, we actually had a great talk afterwards. And, we learned that she had a picture in her head about what a good birthday party was, and I had a picture in my head. But at the time, I felt so judged, and I felt like you know I was I couldn't control her behaviour, and I felt so sort of shown up and judged by my mother-in-law, who I brought this up with recently, and she said, "Oh, I just thought it was funny." Uh -huh. But at the uh -huh. time, I was reading judgment, and so I was a swirl of these uh -huh. things. So you were projecting your own judgment onto onto my child, onto my mother. Yeah, yeah. So it was. I was. I was going for it. So, really, it was about those moments. Yeah. You know, how do we use those moments? Yeah, to reflect. To, to learn and gain self knowledge. I learned a lot there. I really, it was so uncomfortable that it forced me really to contemplate why do I feel so deeply disturbed by this moment yeah but I guess too if you're a, like literally a high achieving career woman before you have children you are used to nailing everything to having everything under control and to everything responds and it's just it all works and then you have children and there's a, I guess an expectation that it's going to be the same like you know you're going to be able to figure out exactly what to do in order to make things happen no <laughs> we, you can't control your children right <laughs> And actually, trying to control them oh. is just been about the worst thing. You know, I've learned it over and over. Yeah. Trying to control them just doesn't work. And um, getting alongside them yeah. is much richer, um, rewarding, connecting journey. Because, of course, you know, one of the things that I think is most important, and I think it's what Silk Milk Yoga is about, is about connection yeah. to to others, to where we are in any moment, and yeah, you know, it's such a great opportunity because we we get that reflected back to us that, that desire to control. Mm. You know, when yeah, you, of course. You stop crying. I don't know what's wrong. Or when you've got a toddler, just get in the car. I'm late. You know, all of those things. And now with teenagers. Which is a whole other beautiful uh, rock. <laughs> but, but yeah, it, it is actually it is great. I'm loving I'm loving having teenagers, and I think it's partly because I have really learned about being alongside. So yeah, I was going to say. So having done this work over the last fifteen or so years, has parenting got easier? Have you changed and grown so your relationship to it has changed? I think so. Yeah, I really think so. And it's easy to say not now, probably if you threw me back in the mix with a you know, a two year old and a five year old, I would probably be, you know, because you're exhausted. So already you you're at the end of your your tolerance is lower, um, you know, all yeah, all your worst behaviours and your best, but you really, you know, it's challenging because you're so tired. But I think it really has assisted me and of course the girls are reading the book in various ways they both have their different approaches to it but just because these things have been a big part of our conversation and i've let them know and i've you know i've practiced apologizing or saying you know i've burst into the room and done something and gone said to them well that was a bit terrible wasn't it i'm going to go back out <laughs> And I'm going to try and do that differently. And they're like, okay, mum, great. <laughs> and go, great. Oh, hi. You know, and we just tried a different way. So, you know, it's just part of our life 
together. Yeah. But what great modeling is that for them? Because A, you're showing them you're not perfect. B, you're showing what happens when you recognize in the moment that you could t- make a different choice or do it differently, you know, and you're, you know, it's not sort of the top down heavy model. Like, what a wonderful way to grow up. Yeah, and they do, they, they're very good at pointing out when I need to, that Huya has said to me before, Mum, you need to read your book. <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, Catherine, it's so awesome to talk to you. And like I say, I'm sure we could have a like, very long conversation, particularly around motherhood and feminism in society. Um, so maybe another time on that. I know that you, it's more than just writing the book. Like you've written the book. The book is out there in bookstores in New Zealand, of course. Um, but what else are you doing around the book? And we, how else can people engage with you? So one of the things that I'm doing is running workshops for mums. So I think the book is very good because we're so often alone mm. in that motherhood and we're in our own space and time um, that that the book is there just for when you get those gaps. So the book is very much a sort of individual tool. Um, it's meant to be a real companion for mothers, particularly in those lonely years. Yeah. But workshops then are an opportunity for mothers to come together. And you know, I'm still figuring this bit out. We're just getting going with it. I had a workshop on Sunday that was two hours long because we figured you know, it was Sunday afternoon. Mums can get a little bit of a gap there for two hours. Um, you know, a really big top-up breastfeed and hand the four-month-old over and then have the two hours and then be ready to go afterwards. So I'm still finding ways uh, for mums to come together. But the intention of the workshops is we come together as a group of mothers very much learning mm. to and it's really not a space of judgment and it's not a space of advice it's really a space where we can come together and practice identifying what we're working with and then sharing the orientation to working with these questions that we have or concerns that we have about mm. being a mother what's current in our lives and it, it was beautiful on Sunday. These women were very revealing of where they were up to, the things they were finding challenging, you know, right through from um, things that felt very immediate, existential, very practical things as well. So quite a range of things and very different mums coming together and actually going, oh, you too? Like, yeah, I totally know that experience and really getting to people resonate with this too and mm. um, that it's not one size fits all and so mums were really we went through a process of practicing tuning into our own wisdom so the yes. title of the book is a guided self-inquiry to find in your own wisdom mm. joy purpose through motherhood so using those experiences of motherhood and then tuning in practicing tuning into what's our own wisdom because we get so much advice yeah, I feel so judged that actually it's very different for all of us. And I'm, I'm saluting you at this moment too because I'm thinking I read your piece on being a gypsy mum. Ah, yeah. And your, your journey that's coming ahead with going to Croatia. And I think you've really tuned into actually what is right for me. And if it's mm. more right for you, you're not abandoning your child, you're bringing her very much with who you are yeah. into another way of being in the world. And you're you know, you're grappling with all those pressures that are on you about you should be, you know, of some fixed abode somehow that's, you know, yeah. there, you should be settled down. But actually, you have another thing to express and another thing to offer and be. Mm. And I, you know, it's really, that's your own wisdom you're tuning into there and you know you're on the right path and you're more aligned. So you're a beautiful example of somebody who's engaged in that process of self-inquiry and mm. coming to know more who you are and how you want to live and then you can you've got to work how do I include yeah Harry? how do I mother <laughs> yeah. yeah how do I want to mother beyond how society thinks I should mother and right. that realization the realization I'm having is I want it to be less separate from the rest of who I am and what I do in terms of I want to spend more time with my child because that you say being alongside them and being present with them is yeah. so incredibly powerful and they don't get that when they're at school necessarily and so I'm like, okay, let's look at what does motherhood mean to me? Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Like, we need gypsies in the world, mm. and we need gypsy mums, and we need you know, people that um, 
that you know cut that anchor and, and float off an adventure. I mean, Christopher Columbus was probably one of those. Yeah, yeah. Probably um, didn't take his kids with him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and navigators of the world in different ways have gone and done that. And yeah. you know what this is going to create for your son and what how this is going to enrich his life. I think of people that have lived unconventionally and lived in boats and travelled with their kids. And what an amazing thing that's been. Yeah. So we do need to tune in and so getting together with those mums, grappling with very mundane and very existential things, that practice of tuning in. We got a lot covered in two hours, it was amazing. Awesome. But um, I just thought, oh, well, I would love to see them, you know, for 10 weeks, for yeah. two hours every Sunday. And it's not always doable. So I'm really wanting to hear from mums. How do they want to do it? One mum's come to me and said, look, if I just get my book club to it, actually my antenatal class is still together five years later, can we have you with us on a Friday night? We like to have a few drinks and nibbles and do a fun thing. Could you do something for us? So I'll go and try and find a way to work in that environment. And another woman at Play Centre said, could you come and be with our Play Centre community in some way? Awesome. So if there's a group yeah. of mothers out there that wants to bring you on in, they just got to get in touch, right? Absolutely, please get in touch. So I'm happy to work with Skype. The other thing that's really exciting is that um, I'm looking at touring with the book through the States and Canada and probably UK and also Australia next year. It's going to be a really big year. Awesome. And so going to key yoga studios and um, offering workshops there. And I'm really adaptable at this point, trying to find out what works for mums because they're, they're really almost the hardest group to yeah. get. You know, to have time on their own because we're so wedded to the work of being hands off mothering. Yeah, awesome. any time we get, is, well, we don't get. Yeah. So, so awesome. really kind of carve that time out for ourselves. Mm. Well, Catherine, thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure to talk to you and to have your book on the show.